An understanding of neurophysiology and subsequent topics in pharmacology, neurology, and other related areas in medicine requires an understanding of the function of the neuron. This in turn requires an understanding of the potentials across the neuron cell membrane. For it is by these potentials the cell integrates its inputs and produces its output signals. To demonstrate these potentials, we shall use an electronic model of a one millimeter square patch of the giant axon of the squid. The theory of membrane potentials we shall discuss was initially developed by Hodgkin and Huxley using the squid axon preparation. For this work, Hodgkin and Huxley in 1963 received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. We shall stimulate the model with an electronic stimulator and display the membrane potentials and other parameters on an oscilloscope. To record a membrane potential, one electrode must be inside the cell and the other out. When both electrodes are outside, we obtain a reading of zero millivolts as seen here on the oscilloscope. When one electrode penetrates the cell membrane, the resting membrane potential of 60 millivolts is seen. Oscilloscope display is 50 millivolts per division. By convention, the measurement is inside with respect to outside, so the resting membrane potential is V sub R equals minus 60 millivolts. We know for an artificial membrane permeable to only one ion, A, that we can calculate the resulting transmembrane potential using the Nernst equation. E sub A equals RT over ZF times the logarithm of the external concentration of A divided by the internal concentration of A. If we calculate this value using the ionic concentrations present in the squid axon, we find that the Nernst potential or equilibrium potential for potassium is minus 80 millivolts, very near V sub R. However, the calculated equilibrium potential for sodium is plus 60 millivolts, quite distance from V sub R. This discrepancy is explained by the fact that while at rest, the neuron membrane permeability to potassium is about 100 times that of sodium. Thus, V sub R is determined primarily by EK with only a slight contribution by E sodium. As we shall see later, during an action potential, the sodium-potassium permeability ratio reverses with sodium permeability being about 100 times that of potassium and the membrane potential approaches the sodium equilibrium potential. If we apply a low level stimulus to the membrane, we can induce a change in the potential. The bottom oscilloscope trace shows the stimulus. A stimulus that makes the potential less negative or more positive called depolarizing. A stimulus that makes potential more negative is called hyperpolarizing. Small potentials of this sort that do not trigger an action potential are called electrotonic potentials. These occur naturally at sensory receptors, where they are called receptor potentials, and at synapses between neurons, where they are called postsynaptic potentials. They decrease exponentially with time at any one spot on the membrane, and they decrease exponentially with distance away from the stimulus site. We can see the exponential decrease with time on a higher display magnification. By definition, the time required for the potential to decrease from its maximum to 37% of the maximum is the membrane time constant tau. 
Tau is numerically the product of the membrane resistance and the membrane capacitance. When larger and larger hyperpolarizing stimuli are applied, increasingly large hyperpolarizations are produced on the membrane. However, larger depolarizing stimuli produce a potential waveform, the action potential, that spreads along the cell membrane without changing shape or decreasing in amplitude. Shown here is the time course of the action potential at one spot on the membrane. Time display is one millisecond per division. To trigger an action potential, the depolarization must reach a threshold level. The action potential amplitude will always be the same regardless of the depolarizing stimulus intensity. This is known as the all or none property of the action potential. Information about stimulus intensity is conveyed in neurons by action potential frequency rather than action potential amplitude. It can be seen that the entire action potential waveform is bounded above and below by the equilibrium potentials for sodium and potassium. The potential changes in the action potential were explained by Hodgkin and Huxley in terms of changes in the membrane conductance of sodium and potassium. Conductance G, which is the inverse of resistance, is similar to membrane permeability and the terms are often used interchangeably. The action potential is seen here at a faster speed. At the start of the action potential, the sodium conductance rapidly increases, allowing sodium ions into the cell and making the interior more positive or depolarized. The sodium conductance then inactivates, stopping further sodium influx. While G-sodium is inactivating, the potassium conductance is slowly increasing, causing potassium ions to leave the cell and repolarizing the membrane. The decreasing membrane potential in turn causes GK to slowly decline. These changes in membrane conductance are sufficient to explain the action potential. Shown here is the transmembrane current during the action potential, which can be further split into a sodium component and a potassium component. When two superthreshold depolarizing stimuli are applied, two action potentials can be elicited. However, when the interval between stimuli is decreased sufficiently, the second action potential is no longer produced. The short period of time after one action potential, when a second action potential cannot be produced, is known as the refractory period. This can be explained by the following. When membrane sodium channels become inactivated during an action potential, they remain inactivated until the membrane potential drops below minus 50 millivolts for about one millisecond. Refractory period occurs because most of the sodium channels remain inactivated and cannot reopen to start another action potential. Shown here are the action potential, G sodium, and the stimuli.
it is possible to apply a large, long-lasting hyperpolarizing stimulus and observe an action potential at the end of the stimulus pulse. This is known as anodal break. It is thought that the sustained hyperpolarization allows all of the sodium channels to reactivate. At the end of the pulse, the depolarizing change causes enough sodium channels to open so that the action potential threshold is reached. The energy content of the stimulus pulse will determine if an action potential will be elicited. Thus, a long stimulus pulse may have a low amplitude, while a short stimulus pulse must be larger in amplitude. The graph of values of pulse duration and amplitude just sufficient to evoke an action potential is known as a strength duration curve. Additional information about the nerve being studied can be obtained from this curve. The experimental setup that enabled Hodgkin and Huxley to study the membrane conductances is the voltage clamp. In this preparation, a double microelectrode is inserted into the neuron. One electrode measures the membrane potential, which is compared by an electronic control circuit to a preset desired potential, the clamp voltage. The control circuit instantaneously injects enough positive or negative current through the second electrode to keep the membrane potential at the desired level. Thus, the voltage is clamped at the desired level. When a depolarizing stimulus pulse is applied, several characteristics of the sodium and potassium conductances are seen. Sodium conductance is rapidly activated, then rapidly inactivated. The inactivation continues for the duration of the pulse because the potential has not dropped to allow reactivation of the sodium channels. Potassium conductance increases more slowly and remains elevated for the duration of the stimulus. Both sodium and potassium conductance are proportional to stimulus amplitude. The greater the stimulus, the greater the conductance increase. Thus, both sodium and potassium conductances are functions of voltage and time. However, only sodium conductance has inactivation. Changes in the chemical makeup of the extracellular fluid or the addition of chemicals that alter membrane permeability can greatly alter neuron function. Extracellular calcium ions normally block sodium channels. A decrease in extracellular calcium results in increased sodium conductance and spontaneous action potentials in nerve and muscle. This is the mechanism for the tetany of hypoparathyroidism and other hypocalcemic states. Shown here is the action potential bracketed by the equilibrium potentials for sodium and potassium. Decreased extracellular potassium increases the transmembrane potassium concentration gradient and reduces the potassium equilibrium potential magnitude. The cell becomes hyperpolarized and less excitable.
increased extracellular potassium has the opposite effect, depolarizing the cell and making it more excitable. Variation in extracellular sodium has little effect on cell excitability due to the low membrane sodium permeability and the relatively high extracellular sodium concentration. Because of more complex reasons, changes in extracellular chloride concentration also have little effect on membrane potentials. Two poisons are of particular interest because of their effects on membrane permeability. Tetrodotoxin, or TTX, one of the most potent toxins known, is isolated from puffer fish and the skin of some newts. TTX specifically blocks sodium channels in excitable membranes. This blocks action potentials without much effect on the resting potential. Death follows due primarily to respiratory paralysis. Another compound, tetraethylammonium, or TEA, blocks potassium channels when injected intracellularly. Because efflux diffusion is blocked, the cell depolarizes due to elevated intracellular positive charges. The cell is unable to repolarize so action potentials are blocked and the membrane potential remains near zero. Compounds that reduce sodium permeability reduce neuronal excitability. This is thought to be one of the mechanisms of local anesthetics. Substances that increase sodium permeability elicit spontaneous action potentials, even in the absence of a stimulus. In a like manner, compounds that decrease potassium permeability increase neuronal excitability until a TEA type block is achieved. In summary, subthreshold depolarizing stimuli and hyperpolarizing stimuli produce electrotonic potentials across the neuron membrane. Superthreshold depolarizing stimuli produce action potentials, which can be explained in terms of changes in permeability to sodium and potassium. Sodium permeability rapidly increases, then rapidly inactivates. Potassium permeability slowly increases and slowly decreases. An understanding of these mechanisms will now provide the foundation for further topics in neuroscience and related disciplines.